Okay. All right. So here's the deal. This is Linus advances Roth's two. All right. Here's the overview. So I'm not super familiar with this audience. So I did a little bit of like remedial Roth stuff and a little bit of like cool new pot robot stuff to balance it out. So there's something for everyone, but it's not all for everyone. All right. So basically, I'm going to talk about Ross, why you should care, how it relates to PX4. I'm going to give you guys some social proof of people using Ross because I think this helps people make the case to, like, say, their boss and their colleagues. Features in Ross, where to get started, and then I'll talk about some advances in cool new Ross projects. Okay, so two questions: Why should I care about this Ross stuff? Um, well, essentially, Ross is free and open source software used all over the world to build the most advanced robots. I saw a robot down the street, running down the street today high likelihood that it runs ROS. So if you see vehicles running autonomously, flying autonomously, swimming autonomously, there's a very good chance they're running ROS. Um, and I think ROS has a lot of relevant features that are going to enable you guys to do more advanced drone behaviors. So that's why you should care. Um, I'm going to just lay this out really, really quickly how this works. So on the left, you have a drone. That drone runs PX4. That PX4 drone can talk Mavlink. There's this thing called MavROS, which is a ROS package, that can talk to ROS. And then from there, with ROS, you can start doing cool stuff. I put a demo in here. This is from the DARPA Sub-T Challenge, like the finals. Just a drone taking off from like a, an autonomous vehicle, then flying around in a cave in a GPS-denied environment. You know, not really interesting stuff at all. Um, there's a new approach that's coming out uh, that is based on some of the DDS vendors for ROS2. I'm not super familiar with this, but this is also what's recommended right now in the PX4 doc, so I wanted to mention it. And I'll talk a little bit about it more, too. But to my knowledge, you can still use MavROS or um, this approach uh, for ROS2 in both cases. So you have two different options. I don't have any opinion right now about which is the best. But if you have opinions, let me know, because I'd like to know. All right, social proof. So a lot of times people say, oh, ROS, you're that little tiny open source project that no one cares about, you know, not doesn't care about, but little tiny open source project that no one uses. Turns out it's been 10 years since that was the case, and now lots of people use it. We have a fairly sizable ROS2 technical steering committee. The ROS industrial membership is huge. You'll see a lot of like Fortune 50, 50 companies up there. We've talked to NASA, US Department of Transportation, DARPA, all branches of the military, NIST, universities, Singaporean hospital system, a lot of people are using ROS. You don't always see it because you don't see the software that's running on robots, but it's there. Um, just another, another data point that I think is salient, we distribute ROS packages. So we only distribute the binaries. This doesn't include virtual machines, doesn't include Docker containers. These are just the binaries that people get when they go sudo app get ROS blank. Last year, there was 600 million binaries were served, so it's not it's a non-trivial project. All right, so why, why would you use ROS2? What's in there? This is like the 1,000, you know, 5,000 foot view of what's going on. ROS has a lot of tools for message passing, synchronous and asynchronous, like command generation. So if you need an API to do those sorts of things, simulization, visualization, logging, deployment, package management, it's all there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And people have been using this stuff for over a decade. Um, even in ROS2, it's now four or five years to go build stuff. Um, and it's used in every robotics vertical. And it's open source, so you don't have any vendor lock-in. And it really actually does increase people's time to getting stuff done. So, so let's talk about a few of the things that are in ROS, if you're not familiar. The first and probably biggest one is that we have ROS packages, which are very analogous to a Python package. So if you're familiar with going pip install some Python thing to do a thing you want to do and get it done quickly, ROS is essentially the same thing but for robotics. Um, so you're looking at packages that do sensors, packages that do planning, packages that interface with hardware controllers. And these are all written in different, they can be written in different languages. So it's not just Python, it's not just C++. It can be a variety of different things. Um, in the ROS community, we have a lot of people just focus solely on path planning and SLAM and navigation. So we offer packages and tooling just for doing planning in like a 2D sense, in a 3D sense, and all of the visualization tools that you would need for that. Um, another big thing, and I think this is becoming more and more relevant for all of our users, is that we 
are getting to the point with Ross where you're getting plug and play hardware. So say you need a depth camera to go and build a 3D model of the world you're flying around in. There's probably about half a dozen of them now that are just sort of pseudo apt get installed this camera and it'll run. Same goes for LIDAR, um, radar, just a whole bevy of different sensors all have ROS packages in various degrees of refinement. New in ROS 2, we also have micro ROS, which is um, in ROS 1, you had to sort of build your, roll your own like hardware interface layer. So you're writing like a, you know, your own C++ library to do something like talk over serial. Micro ROS brings a bunch of the ROS 2 primitives like um, synchronous and asynchronous commands and um, message passing down to the microcontroller level. So you can actually start building embedded hardware that just speaks ROS natively. It's still fairly early, but they're starting to ha have it running on a variety of different RTOSs. There's a lot of you know, dev boards and chipsets that are now like uh, micro ROS capable. So all of the, you know, the big ones you hear about, the, the sort of Arduinos and Teensies and all, all of those essentially now have ROS, micro ROS um, implementations. We're also getting to the point where there's some IDE integrations at this point to make your life easier. Uh, ROS bags. So in ROS, we have this logging primitive. It's not exactly logging. It's distinct from logging, but you can think of it as logging. It's called a bag, and it's just a way of dropping an entire system's worth of data into a storage file. And this includes video. This includes LiDAR data. And there's all the tooling to move it around, chop it up, um, take a look at it, do interesting things with it. And I think this is probably one of the most powerful features of ROS is that you kind of get a built-in black box or a built-in, what do they call it? A box, a box that's in a plane when it crashes, the orange box now, I guess. So that's kind of baked into ROS2. Uh, we also offer in a completely free to use physics simulator called Ignition or Gazebo. Uh, the latest version of Gazebo is called Gazebo Fortress. Um, and it, it gives you all the tools to go build a virtual robot. You can simulate your physics, you can simulate your sensors. It, you know, this is what we use with ROS2. There are other simulators you can use, but this is the one that we work with primarily at Open Robotics. Um, and we, we recommend essentially that you use Fortress with Humble at this point. They're sort of best together. Um, there's also starting to be, and this, this is kind of getting interesting, there's starting to be a little bit more tooling around bringing in map data into Gazebo, which I think is a, a relevant feature for this audience. So people often ask me, where do I get started? There's this huge community. It's been under development for close to, you know, well over 10 years. Where do I get started? There's a lot of resources. Um, there's ROS.org, which is sort of our main landing page. But probably where you want to start is docs.ros.org. That's where we keep all our API documentation. Uh, we also have a discussion forum, so discourse.ros.org. And then we also have our own. We actually started about the same time as Stack Overflow started. So we have our own Q&A website that has 10 years of ROS Q&A questions on it, which is interesting. So recently with ROS2, after you know, going through and building ROS2 over the past, uh, I think we're now at four years, uh, we decided to publish a new like, sort of canonical ROS paper for people to reference when they were publishing their research. Um, this is a really, really handy paper if you're trying to go to your boss and say, like, here are other people using ROS out in industry. This is how it's constructed. This is why it's constructed this way. This is the success people are having with it. Um, what the paper does is we, we talk about the design considerations in ROS2. Then we show five real-world applications, and we strategically chose essentially a, you know, a terrestrial robot, a robot like an ocean-going robot, a you know, a drone, um, a space application, and then an application from heavy industry. Um, and the two to note here, we have like a bunch of Arterians um, ROS applications as well as our ongoing work with the NASA Viper program. Um, and you can find it right at that link right below. So let's, let's talk about the ROS distro lifecycle. The other thing I see people struggle with when they first start with ROS is like, oh my God, there's so many versions. Which version do I use? And generally the recommendation is, Use the newest ROS2 LTS that's out there. What is an LTS? It's a long-term support. Just like Ubuntu, every two years has an LTS version, so does ROS. We recommend you use that one. So this is sort of my graveyard of dead ROS distros on the top and ROS distros that have just been released at the bottom. Um, 
And then we also have a rolling release that is sort of our edge branch where all of these uh, more recent releases are going to come from. Um, and what you can see here, there's a couple things that I think you should note. First is that ROS1, there are only presently two ROS1 versions that are still supported. They're melodic and noetic. Uh, we really, really, really recommend that you use noetic if, you're, if you have to go with ROS1, but also be aware that noetic support ends in 2025. So you don't have that long of a support window to build your application. What we really are recommending everyone use is Ross Humble Hawksbill, which just came out last month, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that Melodic is going to go um, end of life next year. So if you're thinking about using Ross 1 Melodic or are using it, you really need to have a transition plan in place as soon as possible. Um, and then ROS1 support is going to be completely done in May of 2025. So if you're a ROS1 user right now, it is absolutely imperative that you should be thinking about moving to ROS2. It's not going to get easier from here on out. It's actually going to start getting harder to transition over. Um, so like I said, we released ROS2 Humble Hawksbill about a month ago. This version will have a five-year support window, so it will be supported until 2027. Um, the binaries and Docker containers are already available. Um, if you look at the release notes for this, it wasn't a massive undertaking of like new features and development. It really was a focus on improving documentation, fixing small bugs, and, and generally improving the usability of ROS2. So it really is time to start moving over. I, I took a look. We, I think we had a couple hundred ROS2 packages on release day. And I'll talk about a few of them, but I, I checked. Mavros is already available in Humble. So if you want to check out how to hook ROS2 up to uh, Mavlink, absolutely ready to go. Uh, and I, I checked, and it's got a fairly robust set of tutorials. It should be fairly easy to get started. Um, as I said previously, there's also the other approach, which is to use um, the, the micro RTPS client and micro RTPS agent that come out at eProxima. Um, underneath ROS, and this might be a little bit too technical for these discussions, there is a transport layer, and you're able to choose your transport layer, uh, which in this case, it's a DDS implementation. And for this DDS implementation, the default is a vendor called ePROSIMA. They're also working on this bridge between PX4 Autopilot and ROS2. So it should really just be fairly plug and play and easy to use. So let's see, other cool things, new ROS packages that have just come out. Um, we worked a bunch with, uh, for the Humble release, we worked a bunch with UC Berkeley. And they've just released this, and this is out of the, the Ken Goldberg lab, uh, lab at UC Berkeley. They've released this new ROS2 package called FogROS2. And this is, this is super cool stuff. So the problem they were encountering in their lab all the time is you have a robot, it has some you know, maximum compute capacity, and they were always exceeding it. So they were doing more advanced path planning than their robot could handle. They wanted to do more interesting like 3D reconstruction work than the machine could handle and run at the same time. So they decided to create a bunch of ROS tools to uh, uh, automatically push all that work up to the cloud and then return the results as part of a ROS, um, a running ROS system. So if you're in a situation where you have good Wi-Fi or like a 5G connection, you can actually start offloading some of your um, compute to the cloud. Right now it's Amazon, but they claim that they'll have other cloud vendors here fairly soon. Um, and this is just an all around, I think, interesting tool, right? So if you've ever had to go and set this up for Ross yourself, where you have to go figure out how you want to bridge to a cloud infrastructure to move your data, say you're a drone taking a bunch of camera footage that then needs to be delivered to a customer later on via like some dashboard, this should help you get to that really, really quickly. Um, another big thing, and I think this is a big seller for people moving over to ROS2 fairly soon here, is we we've did some work for Humble to get NVIDIA hardware support into ROS2. And essentially what was going on in, in ROS before this is that if you had, say, some imagery data that you had a perception pipeline for, the data was going back and forth between the GPU and the CPU multiple times, and those copy operations introduced a bunch of latency. So we worked to add some um, 
some hooks essentially that allow you to go directly to the GPU, do all your processing, and then move back to CPU land. And what this has all done is it's basically, this is the claim from the vendor, so I'd take it with a grain of salt, but they're claiming approximately a 10x speed up in some of the perception tasks that they were seeing. And you can find that all at the link at the bottom. Um, I, I don't want to just particularly say this is just an NVIDIA hardware thing because there's actually a lot of other hardware vendors that have similar um, um, work going on right now for ROS2. So it's, hopefully this will be something that will just be universally available you know, and hardware independent in the near future. Uh, another thing that's been going on, and this, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so this is the performance comparison. I don't know what this is in. I'd have to go, I quickly slap this slide together. I don't know if that's in flops or some other metric, but I could go check for you. There's a, there's a post. Actually, if you go right to that link, there's a post that holds all the data. Uh, so other things that are going on with ROS2 right now is we just launched the TurtleBot 4, which I know this is a ground robot and y'all are interested in drones, but this is actually a big development for ROS2 in general because this is the platform behind which we're going to be building a lot of the documentation, a lot more of the advanced tutorials for ROS2, and um, the TurtleBot will basically enable us to build out more educational materials for ROS2 in general. Um, I think the first units should start arriving to people here in the next week, actually. Pre-orders started on May the 4th. But what's really relevant here is that we've also released a completely open source simulator for the TurtleBot 4. And so you're able to go take that TurtleBot for free, understand what it's doing, and on top of that, we're starting to build out lessons and guides and a bunch of other material about ROS2 such that you can go and learn how to use ROS2 and then apply uh, ground robot techniques to your drone. Other recent advances, um, it's, it's been a few months here, but I think it's still relevant. We just wrapped up work on the DARPA Sub-T Challenge. And as a disclaimer, I am not a representative of DARPA. I don't speak on DARPA's behalf. Um, but we, uh, at least Ross got to be, and Open Robotics got to be a part of this process. And it was interesting to see all these drones and how um, how this competition really progressed the state of the art for especially situations where you're looking at GPS denied environments. Um, as part of that process and as part of the simulation component of the competition, um, we actually put together a full tutorial on how to do uh, ground vehicle and I believe there's also drone simulations in ROS1. So this is a very good educational resource if you'd like to learn how to put together your own simulation build your own autonomous system, and then start working with some of these navigation techniques. Other things going ahead. Um, looking ahead, space. Um, ROS2 is going to space, kind of. Uh, right now, we're working with NASA to build the ground data systems for the Viper uh, mission that should go up next year. So this is a rover that's going to be going into um, basically the poles, the south pole of the moon, looking for a bunch of volatile compounds and doing other science research. And as part of that, ROS2 is being used and piloted to, to look at um, data once it comes back to Earth. And what I think is interesting about this is this hopefully is a start of people signing off on the capabilities of ROS2, but also its performance. There's already similar sort of ROS2 projects going on, um, one of which is the Astro Bee. So Astro B is based on ROS on a, I think on a Android platform. And then there's another, a couple of other simulations that are using ROS as well. Um, this is all tying together. We're working at Open Robotics right now on this program called Space ROS. It is in its infancy. It's sort of at the requirements development phase. So if this is something that might be relevant to you, please come and talk to me. We're starting to, to collect people and requirements to put together a more hardened version of ROS that might be relevant to these applications. Other new and noteworthy things. I just got back from ICRA, which is the, if you're not familiar, is the big robotics, academic robotics conference. In, it was in Philly this year. Um, and one of the more interesting things is the whole corner of the sort of exhibit space was taken up by this F 110th competition, which is one of these student run um, autonomous vehicle racing competitions that's all based on uh, ROS2. And there were easily hundreds of students working on ROS2, competing with drones. 
And it really, I think, proved out both the accessibility of ROS2, but also its performance. And what's happening is we're actually seeing uh, larger bodies starting to build um, like indie level autonomous cars and these smaller teams feeding into these larger races where you have a full quarter million dollar aut autonomous race car running Ross 2. Um, the reason I bring this up is I, th I thought it was really interesting for at least the self-driving community and I think it's something that might also be interesting for the drone community. Um, you have tons of students that are really interested. They need a platform to start learning on the technology. And this was a great place for students to learn the basics of, um, you know, Ackerman steering, the basics of Ross, how to do path planning, all of these things. And I just thought it was kind of cool. Um, other shameless self-promotion, uh, we have a monthly podcast or a weekly, bi-weekly-ish podcast at Open Robotics now where we're talking to Ross users. So if you need some reference points from various industries about how people are using Ross and what they're using it for, um, that's available. We have RossCon 2022, which is going to be in Kyoto in October. Um, we're always looking for people to talk, uh, people to show up. And then, as I've said before, most of the resources that you would need, you can find on discourse.ross.org or answers.ross.org. And with that, that's what I got. I'm open to question. It, mean, it means no security updates. It means no, I mean, we're no longer going to be building binaries, updated binaries and distributing them. So the binaries that are there will remain available. They're not gonna go away, um, but we're not going to be updating things and doing security maintenance. And that's generally what we mean by LTS. Um, the one thing I will say is what I've seen is when when we end of life a Ross distro. So for example, we end of life to Kinetic last year, and I get to see the download stats. And so Kinetic immediately went from, and I, I'm spitballing here because I don't have the exact numbers, but it was like a quarter of the community to like less, like on the order of 5% within a year. And so really the development, like it or lump it, once you end of life things, people really, it, it sort of is a forcing function for people to upgrade. But it, you know, it's going to be easier if you do it ahead of time. Other I got questions? some questions from Zoom if, if you have the time. So is there any ROS2 package for deep reinforcement learning and PX4 SITL? Wasn't there just a talk about this a second ago? I think in oh, another it was room. hardware in the loop, wasn't it? Yeah, OK, software in the loop. So, I, have, I don't believe I've seen one for reinforcement learning. I have seen this done with gazebo and a simulation before, but it is not a like package. It is somebody basically setting up a system to do it. Um, so what I would do if that was something that you were interested in is get your robot, um, find an analogous, you know, usually it's a ground system and then sort of crib what they've done and then work from there, but with a, um, a drone system. Uh, I was just actually curious what he meant by PX4 was stuck on melodic. So it's not stuck stuff. <laughs> so when you said, um, you know, advise people to go up to melodic, it's generally not up to individuals to do that PX4 dev team, somebody would have to make that big change. Um, so uh, as with ROS, I think most of the development is going in with ROS2, and I don't think the original ROS will be getting any more love to go up from Melodic. You have to use Melodic now. Well, 
I'm not exactly saying that. I'm saying that the underlying um, Mavros is a package that will be used by, by whatever um, particular version of ROS you're choosing to use, and that's being updated by a team that are happy to keep on updating it. But you can't use Noetic reliably. If you, so I, I was just concerned that uh, there would be no access to the, to the binaries anymore. And I, I'm sure that the person who is the main maintainer has a plan for uh, <laughs> moving us on and saying, well, we no longer can use the original ROS. Mm -hmm. um, and there are pathways to do that via ROS too and migrate. So I don't think there's a concern. Did that? So oh. Environment. You'll be getting melodic. If you try and set it up for Noetic, it, there's a good chance it won't work with PEX4. The simulator won't connect properly um, because it uses a different version of Gazebo that we don't support. Um, so the instructions in PEX4 are all around melodic. One last question from well, Zim. I was, the... was going to clarify on that. A couple yeah. things to keep in mind. So there are, there's Rep 2001, which will tell you exactly when these things are going to happen. So it shouldn't be a surprise, but I know how software goes that nothing gets done until it's an emergency half the time. So that, that is part of the problem. But there are, you know, if, if you're the one working on, on these sorts of things, I, there are some tools that can at least help you estimate, like, how hard this is going to be to transition. I mean, it's, that's from the software perspective. So, you know, simulation shouldn't be too difficult, but it's always, you know, you don't know until you get there sort of situation. Okay. How difficult is it to transition from ROS to ROS 2? 30 it, seconds. 30 seconds. It really depends on your system. Uh, what we found and what I've heard from people is it's a lot of hand wringing and worrying, and then people do it, and they're like, "Oh, that wasn't too bad." <laughs> so, you know, it, I, from what I've heard from a lot of people, it's kind of like a half day to a day per package for most things. 